Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be talking here today, although I have to say it's a little bit intimidating with all the lights and stuff. Um, well, like Beb said, I'm the co-founder of a company called The New Motion, and my name is Alef Arendsen. At The New Motion, we're pretty much trying to create sustainable life without compromise. Our initial focus is on the way we move ourselves, and so we try to help drive people electric cars. Now, um, next slide, please. Actually, it's starting all the way in the middle. That's not how I wanted it. Um, well, again, that's me. These are my, par my grandparents. All four of them had their own businesses, and I think entrepreneurship is in the blood, so I guess I somehow picked up where they left off. Now, one lesson that I learned from them was to try to work hard and try to succeed, and while doing so, actually leaving a positive impact on the world around me. In 2004, I founded a business, or co-founded a business called SpringSource. At SpringSource, we tried to make developers' lives easier. In about five years, we grew to about 150 people and became the world's kind of uh, leading provider of Java infrastructure software. We served many of the Fortune 2000 companies as clients, and I'm not surprised that if you've ever booked a ticket through any airline or ever transferred money through any major bank, you've probably used stuff that I originally wrote. How did we do this? Well, we basically made it easy and more fun for developers to adopt Java technology. In 2009, I had three fundamental events that seriously changed my professional life. First, in February, I left SpringSource. I'd felt that as a company, we had made significant positive impact in the world of technology, but I sincerely craved the desire to also actually do something useful in the real world, something I'll explain to my grandma. And actually, software wasn't exactly that, so I moved on. Then, in April, I came across a guy called Richard van Montfrans, and he had the exact same idea. Now, he also wanted to do something useful. Now, this wasn't in the area of double-sided printing or trading of CO2 credits. Actually, it was about electric cars. As the car you can see back here. Maybe we can light it up a little bit, but... Actually, pretty exciting, so you would say. Maybe the curtain uh, can go up? Well, anyway, we'll see about that later. Um, then the third thing happened. In September, I kept my stock in SpringSource. My previous company, SpringSource, got sold to a company called VMware in the US. Now, it was a pretty big deal for me, because now it meant that I'd looked for a new challenge, I'd found it in electric cars, and I also had the resources and the freedom to actually make it happen. Well, provided that I didn't screw up, obviously. Um, so let's go on to look at a little bit of what I want to talk to you about today. Me first, then the world. I sincerely believe the human race is governed by selfishness. <coughs> the tragedy of the commons is a much-quoted dilemma by Garrett Hardin, and it's published in 1968. Basically, it states that multiple individuals acting independently and solely and rationally, only consulting their self-interest, will ultimately deplete a shared limited resource, even when it's absolutely clear that this is not in anyone's long-term interest to do this. In other words, I'll do what I want to do, and I don't, I don't care about the consequences of all of this or me first, screw the world. It's a much used quote as well in the area of sustainability, my area basically, as a reason why we should all change now. We should all stop driving cars. We should all stop going abroad on holidays. We should all be a little bit colder in winter. Now, I think while Garrett's heart and theory holds true, it's actually a pretty bad idea to bash it around people's heads as a reason why we should change now. I mean, I want to drive a car. I, I, I want to go abroad on holiday, right? And I want to be warm in winter. I sincerely believe that if we want to create lasting change as a human race, we have to recognize the premise that we will always act in our own self-interest. So our challenge really is to satisfy that self-interest, but without depleting these shared limited resources. Now, obviously, you're saying, duh. I mean, this is the holy grail of sustainability. If we get there, then we're done. But let's have a look at what self-interest really means. The Greek philosopher Plato was probably much more clever than I am, and I'll use his words then. Human behavior flows from three main sources, desire, emotion, and knowledge. So basically, self-interest means first satisfying my key desires before caring about anything else. Now, my desire is change, amongst others. I'm open to new things, open to any, anything that's new and better, basically. 
But actually, my desires are not your desires. They're not my family's desires, my friends' desires. And this is where this little bump comes in that we all know as the technology adoption curve. And it's a pretty important part. Now, at your utmost left hand, you've got your innovators. The innovators are the creators of often new and better ways. They come up with new things. Then you've got your early adopters. And the early adopters, they look at the innovators for inspiration. They're open to change, open to actually making a little bit of a compromise here and there, and open to new ways of thinking. The early majority, well, they're a little bit less sensitive to change. And they're only actually changing if that what's new is better than what came before. The late majority, they even change much less. And they're actually also much more price sensitive. So it has to be better, and it also has to be cheaper. And the laggards, well, they'll only change if there's no other option, basically. This group, the early adopters, that's what I'm excited about, this guys, uh, about these guys. I mean, they're actually you guys. It's probably one of the reasons why you're here. So why am I so excited about them? Well, basically because they can make or break any technology. First of all, they look at what the innovators create, and if, if it actually matches their desire, then they adopt it. But if, and again, only if, it matches their desire. It represents a much better indicator that if an early adopter adopts something, that mass adoption is going to take place. Then if they would look at the innovators, because the innovators have too many dead ends, basically. They also have a real and direct influence on the market. They like to lead, they like to be different. They also like to try out new things, they like to promote new stuff. So actually, if you conquer the early adopting market, then you're pretty much done. That's what the theory says, at least. It's important that what the product says it does, it actually also does, because if it doesn't do that, it has to obey to its promise, because otherwise it's dead. Early adopters oftentimes also love technology. So let's have a look at a few examples where the early adopters cause something to either succeed or fail. Phones and cars. Now what you see here, basically, is what we call the Motorola Rocker E1 from 2005. Maybe some of you won't know it. It's actually the Apple's first phone. No, it wasn't the iPhone. It's the Motorola Rocker E1 from 2005. Now you would say Apple, the world's coolest computer company, meets Motorola, at the time the world's coolest phone company. What could potentially go wrong, right? Well, a lot of stuff I can tell you. File transfer were painfully slow. You couldn't down download tunes via cell connection, and actually the interface was, well, really, really sluggish. So my desire was to, go on, to, to be on the go and listen to tunes. Well, this thing clearly didn't satisfy it, so it died. Same with the car, basically, here. It's a Sinclair C5. Sinclair, at the time of making, was one of the world's coolest tech companies. So a tech company meets a sustainability issue. It's electric. What could go wrong? Well, not a lot, unless you consider that you want to move around stylishly and not get wet when it rains, right? So, actually, when two companies meet, when two great issues meet, or when an issue meets one great company, it's not guaranteed that it's going to succeed. If you don't convince the early adopters, it's not going to work. So if something passes the early adopters, if something gets adopted by the early adopters, then we have to know what fuels that desire at that particular moment. I think there's four fundamental things that need to be matched, four fundamental desires that need to be matched in the early adopters for something to get adopted in the real world. It needs to be fun, it needs to be cool. You need to be able to do it now, obviously. And what it promises to do, it really has to do, because if it doesn't do that, it's dead. Again, if it isn't any of these four things, then the technology will not succeed in the early adopting society. Now, when all of these four do come together, however, when fun, cool, now and true do come together, then suddenly it all makes sense. And this is actually a really, really important phrase to us at New Motion, because in the past, things might have gone wrong with electric cars, but now, as you can see right here, for example, in our car industry, in our industry, these four things are pretty much true, and they're starting to take place right now, at this point. So that's why I'm so excited about today as well. Now, let's have a little look at where in electric cars in the last 170 years, early adopters didn't really like the cars. At first, we've got on the left-hand side here a simple 
Yeah, the fact of creation of this guy called Professor Sibrande Strating, who I'm actually proud to say is a Dutch guy, and he created this car in 1835. It's totally electric. So the electric car actually predated the internal combustion engine. Now it's simple, yet primitive in its creature forms. It didn't have stereo, no, no air conditioning. Well, well, who needed it anyway? Global warming hadn't been invented, so... Um, then this guy came around, Henry Ford, and this mass production genius single-handedly killed the electric car movement. He created the Model T Ford, and because of this, the, the, cars or the, the price of gas cars plummeted to about half of electric cars. And together with the ever-expanding uh, network of roads and gas stations, it didn't really make sense to start driving electric anymore. Fast forward about 60 years, and there we have this little threesome here. First, there's the Z, um, um, what was it called? <laughs> Sabrine Vanguard. And despite the efforts of this like 70s man standing next to it, it's not really stylish, is it? Um, there's another two, there's the Zap Zebra Sedan Electric, 40 years later, and the Indian Riva. Well, enough said, I guess, right? 170 years of development in the electric car movement didn't get us any closer to matching the needs and the desires actually most of all the desires of these driving early adopters. Nissan, Porsche, Mercedes, Ferrari, for gas cars, they all did it. But in terms of electric cars, there was always a compromise. And compromise is going to kill desire. And then again, Richard showed me one of these, my current business partner. It's a Tesla Roadster. It's um, there, so I can have it now. Um, it looks cool, not many people have got one, so... But it's electric, so how does it go? Well, actually, it's safe to say it goes like crazy. Again, there's a few out on the square here, so you can actually do a test drive. I wouldn't suggest that because it's quite slippery outside. And my car is there, so I wouldn't want you to break it. No, anyway, no worries. Just easily take it out for a ride. But it, not the 60 in 3.7 seconds, and it's actually quite a comfortable drive. So it ticked all the boxes, basically. All the boxes were there, fun, cool, now, and true. And then I got thinking, if I get myself one of these, am I done then? Is it just about the car? And then I realized, no, it's not just about the car, it's more than the car. I have a desire to park and I have a desire to charge. And can I actually afford it? The first phone was a wonderful moment, but if it was no other phones, <laughs> it was pointless, right? Even with a hundred phones in a whole country, it doesn't really make sense if you don't know these hundred people or if you don't want to talk to them. The product is everything, but the infrastructure is even more important. So when I looked at this problem, I just realized that I couldn't do this all alone. I couldn't just buy this car and go off and drive. I needed lots of different parties to work together for it to all make sense, not just the car, but for, for it to all make sense. So the question then is, how does it all make sense? Let's start with the cars. This sports car is obviously nice and all, but what if I want to go to Ikea or go on a skiing holiday or, well, um, do anything else? Obviously, on a sunny day, I drive this, but what if I want to drive something else? Or wouldn't it be wonderful, instead of having one car that doesn't do anything that I like, except for maybe driving on a sunny day, I have access to multiple cars? This is not happening in, 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 in the near future, but there is a bunch of electric cars coming out in the future that will actually allow this. The Nissan Leaf, which is coming out early February next year, a four-person hatchback. Then there's the Fisker Karma, four-person limousine. Tesla is bringing out a model as well, which is going to have a, 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 six, a cap capacity of six people. So there's plenty of cars coming out. And if we get that, we might actually also get to accessing a car that you need at that particular moment, that you desire at that particular time, instead of just owning one car. So cars are coming out, and the whole car model owning business also is also changing. What about charging? I mean, I still have the desire to park and charge, right? Well, fortunately, the City Council of Amsterdam recognized that need. One of the guys doing that is sitting here right in front of me, Mark Linnekamp. And the City Council of Amsterdam is handing, free, handing out free parking spots and charging stations all around town. So I pretty much can park and charge right now, whenever and wherever I want. 
So the desire of me first, parking and charging, has been met. What about the rest? Don't they say these cars only have a range of about 150 to 200 kilometers? Well, this one is a little more, but the cars coming out early next year, yes, they do. So what if I want to drive from Amsterdam to Eindhoven and back? I can't really go there then. Eh? Maybe I have to stay over, but on one day? No, not really. Together with a lot of other parties, again, the City Council of Amsterdam and a bunch of other commercial parties and also supported by the Doon Foundation, a nationwide network of fast charging stations is going to be put in place where I can charge my car in just under 30 minutes. So I can safely go back to and from Amsterdam in one day. Now, I'm a bit of an impatient guy, so we're hopefully getting free Wi-Fi with that so I can check my email while I'm actually charging. So again, me first, then the world. The desire is met. What about cost? Aren't these cars hugely expensive? Yeah, sure. I mean, any technology is a little bit more expensive than what came before. So, fortunately, Mr. Uh, Jan Kees de Jager, our Minister of Finance, he recognized that need as well, and he put in effect a large range of subsidies, making uh, the, the, the price of electric cars actually comparable and sometimes even cheaper than gas cars. So again, the desire was met. Me first. There's a whole range of other stuff that we can talk about today, but I can say that I've pretty much hopefully shown a little bit that this me first, this self-interest has been met now. But what about then the world? Because obviously we need to think about the world as well, right? If these self-interests are met. This is a car that runs on 100% electricity. Now obviously it's very important to know where the electricity comes from, because if we only charge this car by using coal-fired power plants, well, then it's not going to work either, and then the world is not matched. And again, then the product is not true. My vision is that we set up an energy cooperative, basically, that is going to offset energy used by this particular car, maybe, by energy generated by abundant renewable energy sources. Your solar panel charges my car. Now, this is not going to happen in the next one or two years, but at least this car gives us the flexibility to do so. And with gas cars, not possible. All right. So I've created the perfect closed loop. I've fixed my problems. I've satisfied my desires and my self-interest. But actually only satisfying my desires and my self-interest wouldn't be, would it be pointless. Well, it's okay though, because actually, in fact, it's never been just about me. It's always been about you. It's always been about us, early adopters. So fixing my problems also fixes your problems. Satisfying my desires also satisfies your desires. And that's actually the reason why I'm so excited to talk to you about this today, because talking about an idea worth spreading is a wonderful thing. But actually, I think talking about an idea worth spreading that's also come to reality is even more exciting. So you first, then the world. Thank you.